Good morning, everybody. Um, Eva, shall I start by sharing the slides or would you like to? Okay. No, let's share the slides and I think that's why that's how we're going to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So welcome everybody to our workshop. Um, my name is Eva Illich and my colleague is Nora Torchai Nemet. We both teach at the English Applied Linguistics Department at the University in Budapest, Ötvös Lorand University. What is interesting probably about us is that we both studied Russian and lived or spent a longer period of time in Moscow. So we very much hope that at the next conference we'll be able to present or do a workshop face-to-face um, -face in Moscow. But right now, given the circumstances, we have to do it online. And as you can see in the title, one line is one of the key words um, here. Another word here is teaching foreign languages. Um, we'll be focusing on a language which is taught as a foreign language, but is used as a lingua franca. Now, there are obviously languages um, which are used as lingua franca and English is not the only one. There is Russian, Swahili and English. Dora, can you move? Yeah, next. <laughs> so, although we, We'll be talking about um, teaching uh, foreign languages. In the case of English, English is used as a lingua franca, and it's not the only one which is used as a lingua franca. There is Swahili in Africa and Russia, obviously. So what characterizes lingua franca use? First of all, it's scale. Um, when a language is used as a lingua franca, its use trans transgresses borders and may reach a global use, like in the case of English. Another characteristic of lingua franca use is the diversity of speakers. When a language is used by millions of people, all these speakers come from different lingua cultural backgrounds. In the case of English, it's actually quite interesting because about 80% of the people who use English are non-native speakers of the language. Now these speakers come from different cultures, from different, they, they represent different languages, which makes the whole use of lingua franca, a lingua franca language, very unpredictable. You don't know when you know, you're going to speak to somebody in the street in Moscow, who that person is going to be, what kind of linguistic background they have, how they're going to use um, English, what kind of norms they're going to adhere to. So that means that uh, unpredictability is the order of the day when it comes to lingua franca use. But as we have seen the past year, unpredictability characterizes not only language use, but uh, our life, our everyday life. And the reason for this is obviously um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the pandemic affected not only our everyday life, but also the way we use language. As you can see, the word pandemic has become one of the most frequently used ones in the world now. So the upheaval in, the, in our life uh, has been reflected in the way we use language. Actually, we use the word pandemic in Hungarian too. Pandemia, we say. Also, um, the changed circumstances have given rise to words which were not used very frequently before. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see some of the examples like asymptomatic, symptomatic and asymptomatic um, um, in COVID illness, CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, coronavirus, right? Furlough is something really new. Um, this is um, when uh, employees take leave. And in Britain, what happens is that they don't work, but the government pays their salary, the, the part of the salary that um, is uh, the, the part of the salary when they furloughed, uh, yeah. Non-essential, right, this is um, about lockdowns and quarantines, but non-essential shops are closed, and it's only pharmacies and, um, and groceries or supermarkets are open. Quarantine is another one, or self-isolation or isolation. Um, Self-test, actually, is, again, something quite new. And also, we've got the word sanitizer, you know, when we wash hands and we buy these sanitizers. So all these words, all of a sudden have come to the fore because our life has changed. And the changed 
life uh, results in change language use. So the unpredictability, as we can see, uh, of everyday life has filtered through to uh, language teaching. Um, at our university for a year, actually, we've been teaching online, remote teaching and learning. And as we ex we're experiencing it now, this, uh, the same applies to conferencing. Now, there are consequences for that uh, in language teaching. One of them is need analysis. So if things change so fast and, and so unpredictably in our everyday life, how can we conduct needs analysis? How can we assess what our students will need, what needs they will have in the future, what kind of knowledge they need to be able to cope with the unpredictability of life and language use. So this is the fact that we've got in language teaching to the unpredictability. So what kind of language are we going to teach? How are we going to teach it? How are we going to prepare our students for the undefined eventualities that they will have to cope with when they step outside of the classroom? This uh, means that our autonomous learner, the, the notion itself, has to be amended. Uh, traditionally, mean, what we mean by learner autonomy is that the learner controls relevant aspects of the learning process. This has to be amended because the moment uh, a learner steps outside of the classroom, that person stops being a learner. They become a language user. So if we want them to be able to use the foreign language that they learn at school effectively, they have to become autonomous users. And being an autonomous user has to be part of the definition of an autonomous learner. So when we talk about an autonomous user, then what we mean is that this person has the capacity to become a competent speaker of the target language, which means that whatever linguistic means or other means they have at their disposal has to be used effectively and creatively. That means that when they use the language outside of the classroom, the, the target language, they have to be able to identify problems, realize that because the, the speakers present a diversity, there are going to be problems. They're going to be using the language differently. So first of all, they have to be able to detect these problems and also solve them. It all needs actually decision making. Now, our traditional way to do it, I think, um, presents problems. Um, I call this answer oriented teaching. So what we usually do, we give them the question and we also give them the correct answers. So for instance, when we teach them greetings, we teach how, you know, what they should say first, say, good morning, hello, how are you? but also often we give, give a list of possible responses and they can choose from the responses. So, for instance, they can say, hi Kelly, uh, I'm fine, thanks, great, thank you, I'm very well, thank you, not too bad, not very well. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict um, what situation they will find themselves in and what kind of language is going to be used in the situation. And then they learn uh, the correct responses to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the questions. Now, what happens in real life actually is that often um, this is not uh, what the uh, person you bump into asks. They don't ask, how are you? But they might simply just say, all right. All right. Um, and then another person might just answer, to the question, how are you, by saying, I'm good. Actually, this is what young people use uh, these days in England and use the uh, adjective form rather than the adverb. So it doesn't mean that they're good characters, you know, but it means that they, they well. But this is, this is something that um, students might come across and they will have to be able to interpret it and also respond to these um, challenges um, effectively. Mm -hmm. So what if not um, answer-oriented teaching? Uh, I would say that that should be problem-oriented teaching. So they should be able to see that there's a problem. There is something which is not what they used to. And my example is um, the McDonald's advertisement. I'm loving it. Um, what we've got is a stative verb here, 
used in the progressive form. Now, if our students look up the rule in grammar books, like the popular Swan book, Practical English Usage, then they will see that love is among the words which should not be used in the, in the progressive. So what is it then? What, how, how come that this is something that they come across day in, day out, and it's something which is incorrect? Now, this is a problem that they might be presented with and something that they have to solve. Grammar books obviously don't help. So what is it that they do? Probably they will have to turn to the internet and solve the problems. Now, I don't know whether you're ready to do this, but in the chat box, would you put um, the explanation that you would give to your students when they say, all right, you know, you taught us that love shouldn't be used in the continuous form um, and in the continuous sense, but still, this is what we see every day, unloving it. Would you be adventurous enough to put your answers in the chat box to see what... Okay. Let's see what we've got. Any, are there any suggestions regarding the explanation? Can you send them? <laughs> okay. I've got one. Can, can I have more? Okay. Um, I think oh, well, what we've got is one um, answer that's in Chadi's speech. Um, actually, I uh, looked up several websites and um, one of them said that this is, this is incorrect English. Um, yeah, I've got another one. Okay. I'm loving it because I'm loving it now while I'm eating it. That's interesting. This is one of the answers um, that um, uh, one of the websites suggests that loving it, it it's happening now. And I'm, while I'm eating it, yes, this is one of the answers that it refers to the whole process rather than just the action of you know, just one point in time. Yeah, this is one of the explanations. Um, I'd love it all the time. Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah, it's this um, extended time span, I think, that we've got here that you're referring to, yeah. Um, another explanation is something that is related to this, this happening at the moment is that it means um, I'm enjoying it. Um, right now so it's all happening right now so love here has got a different sense um actually this is what's happening in um, in british english these days because when people say goodbye to each other they often say love you and it doesn't mean i love you it's just you know saying goodbye it's it's, it's a bit odd but this is what happens i think yeah and then yeah that's a that's a very good explanation again that we've got emphatic use to attract attention yes and um, I, I think it's true because um, this advertisement was designed for, for native and non-native speakers. And I think because it's unusual, then you, it attracts attention. Um, you look at it and you say, what? And this is what they want to achieve, probably. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Excellent, excellent explanations uh, for students, I think. Um, so can we then move on? So this is what, what we mean by problem-oriented um, teaching. Um, and now let's see how we, uh, how we do that online. Thank you, Eva. So now we, we'd like to introduce to you to Utrecht University and what we do there um, uh, and how we organize our classes. And we would like to present a couple of practical ideas as well. So out at our university, we can use four different online platforms. Moodle and Canvas are learning management systems, and Microsoft Teams and Zoom are video conferencing systems. Um, these are available to all teachers. So besides these, we have an administrative kind of a, um, uh, another system. And from then, we can create virtual classrooms easily and use them with, with um, any of these platforms. So it is up to the teacher to decide which 
platform serves um, the teaching goals best and um, we can use these and we get a lot of support from the university as well. So what are the advantages of these? Um, the learning management systems do not offer video conferencing, but they allow us to organize our courses, not just at the university, but also at our teachers level as well. We organize our learning materials on a weekly basis or by topics as well, um, including all the different um, activities that um, that we ask students to do. We mainly use this for asynchronous interaction. Um, at our university we offer some classes asynchronously as well, so using the video conferencing tools is not compulsory. Uh, we have students from all over the world, so sometimes the time difference can be a problem for students logging in uh, from faraway places. So they can um, join a course which is asynchronous and use um, activities like forums or um, um, direct messaging instead of uh, live video conferencing. Um, learning management systems can record individual learning paths so we can follow the individual development of learners, we can check how much time they spend um, on certain activities, how Pro, how they progress, where, where they have a problem where we need to interfere. So I think the analytics of these learning management systems offer a lot uh, to teachers as well. Um, we very often um, encourage our students to be autonomous learners and discover things rather than us telling them what to do. And uh, I will briefly talk about feedback and evaluation a bit later, but I think continuous feedback is, is one of the, the biggest advantages of, uh, of using learning management systems. It, it, it offers so much potential for, for students to make progress. Uh, video conferencing systems, as I said, we can use Microsoft Teams and Zoom. Um, actually, some teachers decide not to use anything else but the video conferencing systems and uh, offer some materials in, in Teams, it's easy to do. On If they use Zoom, they will probably use Google Drive or something where they can store the readings, for example, or any materials that they use. So these allow uh, synchronous interaction. Um, they did not um, integrate this into Moodle or Canvas be, for several reasons, but basically technical reasons. So students had to go, get used to uh, using several platforms for the same classes and maybe different class, different platforms for, for different classes and they kind of complained about it but I think by now uh, we all uh, got used to this. Um, one tool that we very often use in video conferencing systems is breakout rooms. I think you, you had a chance to try these out earlier. Um, so we decided not to include this here in our presentation because it's time consuming a little by the time, you know, people get together and understand what they have to do and then chat a little and then get down to do the tasks. So um, it's, it, you need to plan a little bit more time for, for doing that, but I think it's a great opportunity for students to socialize. Um, it's a big problem for them that they don't meet face to face. They don't chat before and after classes, they don't sit down for a cup of coffee. So they miss those opportunities when they can um, socialize and breakout rooms offer that possibility. Um, we also try to include collaborative projects here um, where they work in small groups and they work on documents online together. We will give you some examples for that as well. The disadvantages that we are struggling with, and I, I, I don't know if you agree uh, or you have the same experience, is a real problem, I think. So camera fatigue or Zoom fatigue uh, is more often used, is a real thing. So by this time of the year, it's April, it's the last month of the semester. Students are so tired. They just tired to see themselves every day, all the time um, and have, you know, like, the screen in front of them for hours and hours and they just complain all the time how tired, extremely tired they are. Obviously the same goes for the teachers as well. Another issue that we've been struggling is privacy. Um, many of our students log in from home and they have you know other family members around, they have the sisters, brothers, 
maybe younger sisters around and uh, pets. And yeah, it's, a very, it's nice because we see them, we can kind of get to know our, our students better, but also it, for some, it's very difficult to cope with. They really don't want to show their private sphere, their mom and dad coming in. So um, how to solve that is an issue. So we've been talking a lot about whether turning cameras whether turning cameras on should be compulsory or not there are a lot of arguments uh, that say that yeah without having the, the cameras on we don't even know whether they are there but at the same time it's it's not an easy decision and obviously the technical issues as we see here um yeah so muting and unmuting yourself is kind of it's the new the new reply all uh, feature so yeah we need to teach them we need to talk about the, these technical issues with the students and this is what we did so um then besides technology we also try to invent or practice new ways of seminars as well so we um, like to give you a couple of examples of research-based ESP seminars. At our institute, the School of English and American Studies, we offer different ESP types of courses. Uh, one type is applied linguistics, which is the department where both Eva and I teach. So we, we look at language in different um, scenarios and encourage students to, to do research um, based on real life examples. Um, we also have specializations. So BA students can specialize on English in the media or English for business, uh, translation skills, English in films. Um, and there we also do a lot of project work with them. With this, we hope to encourage students to become autonomous. Uh, we like the, if they work in groups and they work individually as well. We focus on discovery learning. So instead of telling them what we think about language or lingua franca or applied linguistics or media, we like, the, like to encourage discovery. And uh, we want to focus on skills development through creative tasks. So now we are going to present you a, a couple of tasks uh, from these seminars. Uh, first, uh, from uh, an applied linguistics course, and this is Eva's example. So over to you. Thank you. So the course is Varieties of English, and uh, since English is um, a global lingua franca, um, there is a lot actually to discover and to talk about. In, in this slide, you can see um, the countries where English is spoken either as a native language or as a second language. And um, it is something that I mean, we want our students to be aware of, because normally <clears throat> when you ask them when they start university, how many varieties of English are there? They usually say, right, American and British. But even within British, there are different varieties. And then we're not talking about English spoken all over the world um, on different continents. Um, the um, two types of, of um, uh, can we go back to the, the, um, the actually the, the map shows the two types of um, varieties. One is um, English spoken as a native language. The other one, English is spoken as a second language first, but then later on as a native language. And um, the latter uh, refer to the uh, countries like India or the um, countries in Africa where the colonizers, the British colonizers took their language, but then um, the people that appropriated it and now they use it um, as, a, as their own variety. Interestingly, if you look at India, for instance, there are more native speakers, actually twice as many native speakers of English than in Britain. So the varieties um, in these countries in Africa and the, on the Asian continent are legitimate varieties. And in the literature, they call word Englishes. And this is again something that shows you that um, the conditions of language use change the way uh, we, we use language. What I mean is that it, English is used all over the world, right? So we've got word and then English is used in the plural. So something that we thought that we shouldn't do you know, when, we, when we learned English. 
So word English is, is something that our students can um, research and discover. Um, I think um, what we also discuss with them is that these are not flawed or faulty Englishes. These are legitimate, often codified Englishes, which um, fulfill a range of functions in countries like India, Nigeria, Singapore, or the Philippines. But this kind of English is obviously different from the kind of English that is used in Britain or in the States, for example. The language has to reflect the reality in which it is used. And this is put nicely uh, by a Nigerian writer called Achebe. I feel that the English language will be able to carry the weight of my African experience, but it will have to be a new English, still in communion with its ancestral home, but altered to suit its new African surroundings. And uh, in our first sample task, we stay on the African continent, right? And um, we do a quiz, right? What the students have to do and what you will have to do is um, look at South African English, South African Lexis. So here you've got a photo, right? Taken in South Africa. And what you have to do, you have to guess what the word robot means in this context. I've, there are two more uh, words actually. So this is the task. You look at the word in context and you have to guess the meaning, right? Now the problem is that how do you ask students to do the task? Uh, what we normally do, the technique we normally use is that we ask them to use the chat box. So type in the meaning of the word, right? But we don't want them to look at each other's solutions. So what we ask them to do is just to type in the meaning that they have in mind. And then on the count of three, they all together should press the send button. In this way, they don't see what the other person, um, what the other person thinks. And actually this is one of the advantages of the, of the internet, because if you do it in class, they probably you know, look at it or discuss it. So this is good for individual work. So can we then do it um, with you too, right? Um, look at the pictures, right? And then uh, put in the meaning that you think this word robot has in South Africa. And on the count of three, press the send button. Can we do it? Okay, now open the chat box. Write down the word that you think, uh, write down the word that you think <laughs> um, robot means, and then press the send button on the count of three. One, two, three. I've got one. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> um, a good guess, actually, road camera, yes, uh, yeah. Um, in fact, um, shall I take you out of your misery? Can I say it? Traffic cam, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Fuel station, that, that's something, yeah, that makes, that makes sense, actually, in the context, yes. Okay. Uh, vending machine. Um, actually, yeah, vending machine is an interesting one because um, a friend of mine who is um, who was brought up in England went to, went to live in South Africa, and when she first saw this sign, she also thought that it was some kind of display or vending machine. Um, mm, bank machine, yeah. Okay. Very good guesses. Um, actually, robot in South Africa means traffic lights. And I think the connection is that traffic lights change automatically. So they're almost like robots, and that's where it comes from, yeah? Uh, 
but it's it's quite interesting robots ahead yeah i have, i haven't seen it anywhere else but in south africa can we do the next word all right so the same here we've got dry and the context in which we've got this word is we are the rainbow nation the place where we dry and eat biltong and watch rugby so put in the meaning of dry put it in the chat box and on the count of three, press the send button. One, two, three. Let's see. Seems to be a difficult word to guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, the sentence should help actually. And it's, yeah, it sounds similar. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. Barbecue. Yes, barbecue in South Africa. Yeah. They, they love that. They, um, they live outdoors. And um, dry is, is barbecue. Yeah, a grilled meal. Yeah. Um, does anybody know what biltong might mean? They eat it, obviously, it's some kind of food. Um, biltong is lean cured meat and it's dried, yeah. Meat, yes, that's right, yeah. Dried usually, yeah, um, dried meat, which is sold in strips. And they watch rugby, they're very, they're very good at rugby actually. They play rugby, but this is the sort of the British heritage. All right, we've got one more word, techies. All right. And the context is, since I'm sports fanatic, I'm more comfortable in track suits and tackies. So what might it be? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we've got we've got the answers. Yes. Trainers. Yes. The the trainers. Prim source, Canvas shoes. Yes. Yeah. What they do is they've got one word for quite quite a few words that we would use in British English, for instance. So trainers, um, plimsolls, canvas shoes are all tackies, yeah. The same as um, in South Africa, they use jersey for cardigan, pullover, jumper, everything's a jersey. Okay, so this is one of the things that we can do. I have a quiz about Lexis um, in one of the varieties of English. Um, another variety that we can look at is Indian English. As I said, there are more native speakers of English in India than in, um, in, in the UK. So how can they research Indian English? Actually, it's something fairly, um, it's something that they can come across fairly frequently. There was a movie in 2008, which was a huge success. It got eight Academy Awards and it was Slumdung Millionaire. And uh, the characters in the movie uh, spoke the kind of English that is used in India. There was another one, um, Lunchbox, which is interesting because this is, this is an Indian movie. Slumdung Millionaire was directed by Danny Boyle, so not um, an Indian director. But Lunchbox is an Indian one. And what is interesting is that how the characters use their local language, their first language, together with English. So what they do, they code switch all the time, uh, which is really interesting. And then researching Indian English, there is a huge resource there, literature um, written by famous um, Indian writers, Salman Rushdie being one of them, but many of them. And what they do is, uh, is the kind of way that English is used in the movie Lunchbox they mix uh, the Urdu or Hindi or local languages with English, and this is the way they write. So there is, um, there is a lot when it comes to Indian English, and also what they can do is they can, our students can use um, YouTube uh, when researching Indian English. So what we're going to do now is we're going to listen to Indian uh, English and Indian accent in particular. Your task will be to watch the video and answer three questions. One of them is, 
what is Indian pronunciation like? The second one is, what do Indian speakers of English think of their English? And the third one is, what do Indian speakers of English think of other speakers' English? So can you watch them? And while watching them, please look at the questions and answer them. Hey, everybody, it's Sheetal Information Boss. Did you know that English is a very widely spoken language in India? In fact, whenever we do the street interviews, viewers always wonder that why people are answering in English and not in Hindi. So what do Indians think about this? Are they actually aware of how their accent sounds? Let's hit the streets of Mumbai to find out. If you had to take a guess, what percentage of Indian population can speak fluent English? Maybe 40. 40%, 40 maybe. If you're going to any colleges or school, no one speaks English, Hindi at all. It's everything related to English itself. So I think that 70 to 80 percent might know English. English is, I think, far more important than Hindi right now for Indians. So yeah, I think 40 to 45 percent around people speak fluent English. I guess around uh, 75 percent of Indian people can speak English fluently. Hmm. Um, most of them are from South India because they are like. Uh, they are much more educated than the people living in North India. So that's my opinion and my I am myself a South Indian. So. By the way, Indian English does have a particular accent. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think it does. It's actually proper English. So it's not accent, it's, it's proper English, simple. Yes, pretty much, but uh, it, it has nothing got any problem with uh, Indian people as such because that is the way we talk. So for you, it is normal, right? Your accent? Yes, it's normal. As an Indian person, were you aware that foreigners often make fun of the Indian English accent? Yeah, it is actually uh, like when um, I have not personally encountered the situation, but my uh, like I have cousins who live in the US, they speak uh, that, uh, you know, US accent of English. But still they get judged, like this person looks Indian and you know, people, I don't know why, it's basically racism and it's just senseless to me basically. Yes, I was, but uh, after I went to the United States, I thought they spoke wrong English, so I made fun of their English, so it doesn't make any difference to me. <laughs> I think our accent is better than theirs, because uh, they, I think they are like, not that good, it looks like they are spitting. Well, I think, uh, sorry, yes. <laughs> sorry, not offensive, it looks like they are spitting. And I think our accent is better, yeah. No. No. I think they need to learn English from us. It is like when we hear them, we find it funny. It's lame. I don't really care what they think. Like, I can speak English and I can, like, you know, make other people understand what I want to say. That's enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, the, now the problem that we have um, in the classroom too is that we've got the questions and we've got a group of 15 or 20 students. So how are we going to have the discussion? If um, we have a smaller group, I think it's easier because uh, if we have all the cameras on, then we can see each other. So we can have a conversation which is very similar to face-to-face uh, -face conversation. Um, what also we can do is we can use the um, uh, raise your hands um, feature so whoever wants to talk they can put up their hands and the third option is to put the answers in the chat box so um, I don't know how we can do it maybe could you just put your um, yeah do you want to put your hand up I mean this is what we have to decide how we're we going to answer the questions from the three choices we can't see each other so what we can do is somebody who is happy to answer the question can just chip in or um, we put our hands up. So can we just say that somebody who, who thinks that they, um, they have a view of, of Indian pronunciation, can you just say it? Switch on your um, microphone and say it. What does it sound like? Okay, shall we have it in the chat box? So what does it sound like to you, Indian English? Is it appealing? Is it something that's, that's nice? Okay. Um, I think what really happens is what they talk about is that, that a lot of people find it funny. 
but there are millions of people who use English that way. Now, what is interesting, I think, is what, what do they think of their English? Can you just put the words in the, in the chat box, the, what, what they said about their English, their own English? Okay, well, we don't have anything. Anybody who would like to say it? I think it works better, yeah. Quite pleasant, but there are a lot of soft sounds. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it, it takes too much time uh, to talk, so I believe that it's better uh, to share our opinions this way while speaking. Well, answering the first question, I would say that uh, this uh, English, the one that was in the video, sounded uh, pretty good to me because I heard uh, much worse <laughs> in the English, if I may, uh, say so. Um, I'm not very good at describing the pronunciation. Uh, this one sounded okay, though they uh, made some uh, wrong stops and uh, intimated in a particular way. Yeah. Uh, the sounds uh, they uh, pronounce sometimes they um, make them, uh, well, how to put it? Um, no, I'll, I'll let somebody else uh, do this. I'll take, I, 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 uh, I'll I, I think I think this one yeah, actually yeah it, uh, the, the intonation is definitely different the, the the gesture the way they say it yeah and also the uh, um, yeah and uh, handling the second question uh, I think that they are very confident and they believe mm -hmm. that uh, they speak English uh, better than um, native speakers of English yes they yes. understand American yeah. I think this is surprising how confident they are. I mean, they say that they, they should learn from us, uh, which is uh, something that you don't hear when you ask people who learn English in, in Europe, for instance. They seldom have the, the confidence. Yeah, the vowels are short, somebody put it there. Yeah, four eyes all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do they think of other speakers' English? That's quite interesting too, I think. Remember what they said about the way uh, English people use English? That it's like spitting <laughs> when, they, when they speak English in, in England, that, that, that is like spitting. So I think what is, what is quite interesting here is that their confidence and the way they use English and they know that you know, that's their English, take it or leave it. And I think this is the confidence that we often lack when we teach English people are usually ashamed of their accent, whatever accent they are. Yeah, yeah, this is what they say, that Indian English is proper English. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that's how it is. And actually, when you, um, uh, when you look at Indian English, that's the kind of English they use in that huge country. And when you go and live there, that's what you've got to use. So uh, that applies to lexis and grammar too. This is something that students can also uh, research what kind of uh, words are used and how, are, how they are used. For instance, instead of three times, they say thrice. There are journals, there are internet resources. There's a corpus called the International Corpus of English, which contains many variet varieties of English and Indian features among them. Uh, I think we can move on to um, different uh, projects and tasks. Yes, um, let's have a look at some other types of projects that we do um, in our uh, specialization classes. Uh, this, one, this example uh, is from uh, English in the Media, uh, where we look at different media genres and how English is used um, in those times. This is uh, how English is used in advertisements. Um, I think what it is important here is that instead of kind of um, explaining how English is used in advertisements and giving them examples, we kind of turn it upside down and ask them first to, to collect sample ads, to look at some advertisements that they like and focus on the language, which is something they don't necessarily do. You know, they get carried away by the video or images and funny characters. But, so I ask them to look at um, uh, the language of the of the advertisements. Then we try to typology to set up a typology of advertisements. Um, it's 
I, there is no correct answer to that, which is difficult for them to believe first. Typologies work really well because they can only group uh, anything, basically. Here we talk about advertisements, but you can use this technique with, with any other um, uh, research project that you, that you do with them. They, they basically have to find the difference, differences and the similarities in advertisements here. So they work in groups, they discuss, and they you know, try, to, try to come up with the correct answer. And then I tell them there is no correct answer. We can compare the way they, they set up the typology uh, by looking at the differences and similarities they found in how English is used here. Then we look at the format um, and finally we start um, putting together our project and I'll ask them to write the scripts to uh, here the task was to advertise their, their own language school where they want to teach English. Many of them are future teachers so they're very interested in, in language schools and how they can be advertised. So first write their script, then discuss that in groups and finally we also look at the visuals, the colours, you know what, what colours mean, what strategies are used. Um, it's very interesting that this group here added 10% discount for after class drink as a <laughs> as a nice uh, treat for, uh, for future customers. Um, they also wanted to emphasize how colorful they are, how playful uh, their language school is um, in the one on the left hand side. And the other group on the other side of the screen, they wanted to, to convey that they are different from any other language schools. They do it the other way around. So they turn the whole ad upside down. And then they present, the groups present uh, their um, products to each other and we uh, evaluate and um, they give feedback to one another. It's a long project, uh, uh, it takes time to do this, but, um, but, you, but I think it's, you know, th th this kind of discovery is, uh, is very, very important for them. And uh, online it works um, easily because they can, they can uh, work in breakout rooms, discuss things, use the internet at the same time um, and do collaboration um, online. Another project that um, is even longer is, um, is, is also from the media. We asked them to write things, to develop creative writing. And here they have to interview someone, a real professional. Again, now when we are all online, um, professionals are also more approachable because they are, you know, besides the computers as well. So they, our students can, um, can think of uh, an area or somebody they want to um, approach. And I asked them to think big. So one of my students now who is from Indonesia, she's trying to get hold of the ambassador of Indonesia to Hungary and interview him. I, I hope she'll manage. Uh, it's a very interesting person and, and she's very proud of, of you know, um, of her work and of her um, like courage to, to actually approach such, a, such an important person. So first I asked them to do background research. They discuss who, who they planned to interview and then brainstorm the interview questions together. Um, a, a big part of this is contacting the professional. So they find it very difficult to write a proper email and ask, you know, celebrities or important people for an interview, even if they know them. So we talk about how to write an email, how to communicate this online. And then obviously conducting the interview, talk about the questions and how they behave, how they have to um, record it and um, mm, come up with new questions, maybe uh, listen to the, to the interview and so on. Then they have to transcribe it and write it up into a, um, an article. Now then comes the interesting thing, we also want to publish it. So um, they illustrate it, they edit the final drafts together. We do it, by the way, in Teams, because in Teams you can uh, edit the, the document together as a group and, uh, and then publish the interviews. So we started a, um, an online student magazine the, the title is Twisted Ideal because DEAL is the abbreviation for Department of English Applied Linguistics where we work. So this is our journal, our online student journal. And you see that they uh, publish their own articles. After they graduate, they very often come back to this and read each other's articles and also boast with them publishing an article. They can put this on their CVs and yeah, they do it 
everything from the beginning to the end. We even set up very often a, an editorial board where they decide on, on categories. So if we miss an article or a, an interview from a, from a certain category, they make sure that somebody takes that and then they decide when it is publishable and it's done in WordPress. So it's not very difficult to edit, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's a whole project. It takes um, maybe um, five to six weeks to finalize the article, but they learn so much. It's, and it's learning by um, researching and discovery and, um, you know, making decisions on their own, um, on their own learning. Um, a very interesting um, idea here is um, how they can cooperate online. I, I, I referred to this many times. So here is an example uh, with the advertisements. They started uh, choosing their own favorite advertisements. And then this is the topology they came up with. Um, and this is mind mapping online. They can again do this together. I know it's too small for you to see. I just wanted to show you that that it's multimodal as well. So it's not only text and colors, but it's also, they can include videos as well. So, um, and images, of course, here they opted for videos and then uh, come up with some explanations like this was an, an iPhone ad and, um, and they wanted to, you know, point out um, why they, they, they thought this was a clever way of doing this. It's simply too simple to understand, eye-opening, diverse, whatnot. They see each other's comments. So this one is MindMeister um, that we use here, but there are other um, online collaborative um, mind mapping uh, options that you can use. Um, obviously, assessment has to come with, um, with autonomy as well. So um, I cannot just ask them to write a paper about uh, what they did over the, the semester. So what we generally use in these classes is uh, continuous assessment um, and different um, alternative types of assessment. So we use peer feedback uh, portfolios very often. Um, we can um, include gamification in the sense that they can get uh, competitions or badges. Uh, very often we like collaboration, collaborative projects and um, using rubrics to, to give feedback to, to each other as well. Um, Moodle and Canvas or any learning management system um, is really good to use for a complex and individualized assessment because they record every single click that the students do there. So if they upload or share um, their work, if they participate in a forum discussion, if they upload a, an, an image or uh, a, they work on a database, everything is recorded and you can give points or scores for anything they do. Um, and then by the end of the semester, they have a whole range of different activities that, they, that it's good to look back to and then you can as a teacher you can decide um, whether you want to treat them at, you know similarly or whether you want to use weighted evaluation matrices. I don't know if you understand this I just want to show you a quick um, look at how Moodle offers this so in Moodle you can um, use continuous grading and uh, it also synchronizes grade types by that, I mean, if you, for example, have uh, different types of activities, for example, a short self-test, uh, testing themselves with, with test items, like let's say 15 questions, then you have a, um, a little, I don't know, recording that they did and you give points for that and you use rubrics in the third one. Now Moodle can, can harmonize or synchronize all these different grade types and then give you the percentages of how well the students did. You can also decide on weighted grading. For example, if when they do peer evaluation, you can say, yeah, if you know peer evaluation is worth like, let's say 40% and your evaluation is 60% for the same task. So it's easy, it's like easy to kind of set this up in in the gradebook in Moodle and uh, assign percentages here as you as you see for example I could um, give for you know for the assignment that I give I can um, assign a a higher weight and then decide on the final assessment. Um, Finally, um, we'd like to invite uh, you to uh, cooperate in this one. Try this uh, cooperative 
um, brainstorming technique that we use very often with students. So we open a, um, a Google document that they can all edit together and then uh, ask a question which is kind of difficult to answer. This one was again from an applied linguistics course and I said women are better language learners than men and students had to think about you know whether they agree to it or not and then add their um, ideas. I like this technique because um, you can see the, the different reactions mm -hmm. but it's still anonymous what uh, but you see that the, the, the diversity even in, in colors there. So we prepared a little tricky question for you or a statement and uh, I'd like to try this out. So this is the document if you uh, would like to um, participate. So you can scan the code. Eva and I are experienced <laughs> so to say, so we're not very young, uh, but um, um, you know, very often it's uh, people say that, yeah, it's easy for young language teachers because they are better at online teaching. So if you want to participate here, please um, go to this Google document. I will stop sharing now and uh, give you the link. And uh, um, yeah, I'd like to see what your reactions are. Um, Please just there's one rule to, to follow whenever you want to add your um, opinion, please start a new line. So do not continue the one, but start a new bullet point if you like. And I will try and share the document. So do you agree? Young language teachers are better at online teaching. We have, uh, yes, thank you. We have 10 minutes left, so um, you'll have some time for questions as well after this. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Try to make sure that you can access this. Can you check? Um, I make made sure now that um, it's you can also um, edit it. I see that you're looking at the document. Um, so can you can you just let me know if you can now? Type in as well. Mm. Okay. Works. <laughs> I think as teachers, it's online. It's very, mm, it's very difficult to actually estimate how much time people need to think about the answer, right? So we we know that we have limited time here, so we kind of try to to rush a little bit. Um, but yeah, probably with students, you will have a better understanding of, you know, how much time they wanna think um, it through and then leave them time to reflect and, uh, and give the answers as well. Mm.
Yeah, young teachers are more tech savvy. That's true, definitely. Anyone else? Um, when you ask students to, to brainstorm online and um, write down what they think, very often those students find it easier to participate who are shy to, to, to interact or to talk in class and um, no access still. I mean, I, I see people typing. Hmm. Can you try again? Okay. So it's, it, it is kind of a more democratic participation very often that I see there. They also have some more time to, you know, to think about what they want to say. And um, yeah, they practically were born with the internet. That is true, but we, we don't, very often we just don't spend enough time on explaining how things how things are done on the internet so with moodle or canvas or um teams and zoom as well so i think it's worth talking about um how to um, interact how to um, uh, express their thoughts how to come in and and share their opinions um so yes they are more experienced but in many ways they are um less self-confident uh, with using the internet for um, also uh, learning. So yes, they are confident with Instagram and uh, uh, Facebook Messenger, but they're not that confident when, when it comes to um, research and, um, and uh, creative writing, let's say. Okay, I think I will stop sharing here so that um, we had enough uh, time for questions, so uh, Eva, it's back to you then. And I will share the. Um, okay. Uh, you're muted, Eva. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I just I just want to say that. It seems that um, age is not really a barrier. Uh, we've got the experience as teachers and experience in lifelong learning. So we can exploit uh, the internet sources and platforms each way in ways which are conducive to learning. And with Nora, we hope that in a small way, we also manage to contribute to the successful application of 21st century technology in language teaching. Thank you very much for your attention. and. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think we've still got five minutes to answer them. Spasiba Balshoya Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. So if there are any questions, then feel free to, to ask them. I think we just can mm -hmm. um, do it. Yeah, Anna, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. I have one question concerning assessment. Um, I'm interested whether uh, teachers at your university uh, are free to decide uh, which uh, system of assessment to apply. I mean, uh, do you have a unified system or every uh, language instructor uh, is to decide for themselves or what to do in terms of assessment how to fix the settings etc yeah it's a very good question Anna. obviously we have different classes different types of classes so for exams for example like um, uh, compulsory exams for students yes there is a very strict kind of a description uh, for seminars it's a little bit more um, up to the teachers to decide Mm, what we have to comply with is that in the very first week of each semester, teachers are obliged to let students know uh, what 
what they are going to be graded on and we have to keep to that. So it has to be in writing in the course description and they students, if they don't feel comfortable with that, they can switch classes. Very often we work with um, large numbers of students. So they have the opportunity to choose another class if they don't like it. So that is probably the only restriction. Um, also, when we teach the same subject with several of us, like we have sometimes 30 seminars for teaching the same thing like basic like introduction to writing or academic skills or or courses like that then we like um we very often come together and agree on the basics just to make sure that that students relatively are treated in the same way so it's not kind of very um very different so that in some classes it's very easy to get a grade and then in the other it's like almost impossible so um, we try to agree um, among ourselves just to keep these um, classes similar. But then we have a lot of academic freedom in deciding on this, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions, please? Uh, we hope uh, it would be nice to hear from you as well, like like how you do things. Uh, I think we're running out of time. So I, if you want to share your experience, it, we, we, I think we'd appreciate that as well, if, you, if there are no questions. <laughs> okay. Maybe, not, maybe next time when we, when we can do and it's much easier to do it that way, I think, especially sharing experiences, I think. Um, yes. Online is a bit more um, difficult in that respect, I think. But maybe um, uh, on this note, we can uh, say goodbye and thank you for your attention and participation. And hope to see you in person next time. Thank you, thank you so That's much. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I think everyone liked the presentation and different approaches that you use so we would be glad to meet you next time face to face offline we hope yeah. so and you're welcome to budapest as well so yeah. thank you let us know thank if you're you. around thank um, you very much yeah we'll be organizing actually a conference in september mm. and i sent the um, um magic organizers um the mm -hmm. uh, the call for papers yeah, so I hope to see you there first and then you must go again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.